as Alex mentioned, I actually have a background in geography, landscape architecture, and planning. And uh, I combined all of those kind of skills to do the work that I do. Um, but I, I usually like to start my presentation by saying, you know, the rise of big data is we're supposed to change the world we live in, but I believe big data will not change the world unless it's collected and synthesized into tools that have a public benefit. Um, I run the Civic Data Design Lab at MIT, um, and we take data, kind of uh, spreadsheets that look like this, um, hard to access, hard to see, hard to understand, and convert them into images that we hope can expose policy issues. And so this map actually was done uh, with um, uh, my colleague, Laura Kurgan at Columbia. Um, and I use as an example of what I mean by exposing policy because in this map, we took data from the criminal justice system, um, intake data, from when people um, entered the prison system and mapped where they lived before they went to prison and added it up block by block and figure out how much it costs to incarcerate people from those blocks. So these very red dots show those locations uh, where it costs over a million dollars to incarcerate people in one year. Um, when you zoom in, you can see that this area in Brownsville, Brooklyn, over $17 million was uh, spent to incarcerate people from these 17 blocks. And the idea of this project was that, um, what if we spent just one million of that dollars on the systemic issues that cause people to be incarcerated in the first place. So job training program, education, re-entry services. Could we allevi alleviate the mass incarceration in many of these neighborhoods? Um, these are the maps that are in the Museum of Modern Art. Um, they're here um, in the back. Here they are now part of the permanent collection. So if you go um, to the museum, they're on the fourth floor. But I mention it here. Um, because actually part of what of the work that we do in the lab is try to bring images to a larger public and bring policy to a larger public through data visualization and um, design. And so here in this situation, uh, Congressman actually saw our maps and used them in his presentation to Congress um, and was able to ultimately um, uh, produced the Criminal Justice Reinvestment Act of 2010, uh, which allocated $25 million to re-entry programming. So now, obviously, $25 million is not enough when we look at those 17 blocks, but it is um, a start. And so the idea of the work that we do in the lab is really thinking about how we can um, take data visualization and translate it to policy action. So, you know, if 80% of the data stored in the world, it's roughly like 80% is privately owned, I'm really interested in how we can use this data for public good and unlock data for policy change. And I have three methods that I do this with, and I call it the build it, hack it, share it methodology. Build it, hack it, share it, everybody, don't forget. Um, uh, so what do I mean by that? Um, build it. We all have little uh, data receivers um, that we carry around with us every day. And these mobile devices have the ability to collect data um, where other data sets not, might not be collected and actually represent that data to governments um, to create um, an image of a place from the perspective of communities. Um, and so really um, building, this is also really important in places where um, it's really hard to, to build data set because the government hasn't created it. And we're gonna talk about a project um, here today. Hack it. 
websites, social media data. We're constantly giving people our data sets. Um, and um, I say let's hack those data sets and use them for policy uh, transformation. So actually take that data back. Um, and use it to describe cities. And this is particularly useful in places where it's really hard to access data. So places like China, um, for example, which we'll talk about today. Share it. One of my uh, methodologies is always sharing uh, data set. I think sharing the data and uh, images that we create uh, builds trust between uh, the policy experts, government, and stakeholders that you want to work with, and it actually allows the data become um, more than you could think it would be. Um, so let's talk about hacking it. And I like to tell stories with data, so each one of these themes will be um, a particular story. So um, as I mentioned, uh, websites and social media sites um, often hold a wealth of information that can be scraped and transformed into policy analysis. Um, and we recently worked on a project where we did this um, in China looking at the issue of ghost cities. Ghost cities are um, these empty um, cities. Uh, they uh, were built, but nobody ever moved there. Um, and we had the idea that if we could map these cities, we would actually be mapping the foreclosure crisis before it happened. It would be very similar to that here in the U.S. And um, I should just uh, mention um, uh, that uh, 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 ghost cities, I'm actually going to just stop this for a second. Um, Ghost cities are not just this large cities that you think of and you might have heard about in the press um, called Ordos, um, but uh, in this particular exercise, we're looking at vacancy that are spread across large cities, and there's a lot of vacancy in China. Um, and so it's also very hard um, to actually find data sets in China to map where these are. So our idea here is could we map the, the vacancy crisis in China? Um, and we decided that we would use social media data to help us do this. So this is actually us grabbing Dian Ping data. Um, that Dian Ping is the Chinese version of Yelp. And our idea here is that Thriving communities need amenities. Um, and we scrape data about grocery stores, um, beauty salons, like restaurants, um, and looked at all of the amenities. Then we also scraped data about where all the residential points of interest were. And we um, overlaid a grid, and this is actually Chengdu, um, and we um, measured how far amenities were from the centroid of residential cells. Um, and um, we looked at um, areas um, inside and outside um, of Chengdu, and we actually accounted for um, how far you would be away from a suburban area. Um, and we used something called Hansen's gravitational model that measures urban accessibility. And we added actually how much people use a particular site um, through the Danping ratings. Um, we then did that amenity score for the whole city. Uh, we uh, took everything from the mean above out um, and then um, looked at spatial order correlation to cluster those areas that have high amenity scores. And um, we then decided to see if those areas were in fact ghost cities. So we went and ground truth our data in Chengdu, Tenden, and Xi'an. Um, so if we look at some of our results, so those very red dots um, are showing those areas where our amenity score was particularly high. Um, and we went to these sites. So a lot of the sites that we found when we did our ground truthing process were sites like this one. 
Uh, they were developed in the last five years. Um, this one is about six years old. Um, and um, I, the Chinese government would argue that this location will, will eventually, uh, people will move there, um, but they haven't yet. <laughs> um, and this is one of the strategies um, that they talk about is that they're kind of building for the future potential population. And uh, if you talk to the Chinese government, they say they can wait 10 years for somebody to move there because um, what's more important to them is the kind of uh, economic growth they can get by building these developments themselves, right? So the jobs that can be created um, through the development patterns. Um, we found a lot of stalled developments like this one. Um, and um, uh, a lot of times uh, ground has been broken, uh, but you would actually see buildings in and around it. And many of the buildings around uh, these stalled developments that came up in our model would be um, mostly vacant with maybe some people living in them. And so one of the things that this highlights as well is that um, many uh, Chinese citizens have four or five homes. They use um, housing as an investment strategy. Um, and so even though this might be partially occupied, the building might be completely sold. Um, because um, they don't have kind of a stark market, a way to invest their money, so they invest their money in um, real estate. Um, we found some, our model found actually some older communist housing uh, blocks, and this is um, uh, one um, that um, is around also some largely vacant, these are kind of semi-occupied buildings, um, but these were actually completely completely empty um, older buildings. Um, and then um, we found complete cities. Um, so what I have been showing you is kind of more neighborhood level scale. This is a whole entire city um, that um, was never occupied. This was going to be the science museum. Um, and then what we did is we created an interface um, to describe our model. Um, so what you can see here is actually um, on how the amenity score was developed. And so if you look at one of these red cells, you can see that the main reason that that is a ghost city is because there's not a mall or a medical facility nearby. Um, also, it lacked um, proximity to schools. Um, and the idea of making um, this um, interface is so that we could bring the data to the planners in China that are making the decision about where these ghost cities are to expose the issue, but also for many of the local planners um, who want to um, redevelop these areas and actually make them thriving communities, it can be used as a tool. And so this is part of what I talk about in terms of opening data up um, so that anybody can be using it. Um, so one of my methods is that I think it's really important when you make a data model to not just ground truth it um, by going to the site, but actually to ask uh, local planners and stakeholders if the model accurately, accurately represents what they know to be true on the ground. So when we went and did our ground truthing, we um, interviewed uh, local planners. This is actually a senior planner, and we actually showed them the interface that we created. Um, so this is some, uh, just a sampling of some of the responses we got. Vacant developments are controversial to local politics. So, um, you know, what this planner told us is that, um, you know, like many of the planners in localities know that there's a, a huge problem with vacancy, yet the directive to open up the land comes from the higher levels of government. And so they have to um, actually 
meet that mandate, open up the land, even though they, they know that it's probably not suitable for development. Um, and so it's, it's a kind of very controversial at this local level because many planners know um, that it's kind of a problematic prospect. Um, I should note here while I'm talking about it is that, you know, really uh, part of the issue here is that um, uh, the government can, can control and open up this land and they do it to increase economic economics in particular areas or to kind of drive the building industry. Um, this is a deputy uh, director of the Xinyang Planning Districts and one of the things that he told us is that decisions were mostly based on theory without open uh, big data and so again he's making the comment that um, a lot of the decisions about where to open this land is based on just kind of theoretical ideas. I mean, most likely uh, government uh, um, has some kind of value proposition that they're getting out of opening up particular pieces of land. Um, this uh, real estate developer says that the burst of real estate bubble will carry irreversible impacts on residents who buy houses with mortgages. So one of the things that he was really talking about when he looked at this um, data set is that, um, as I mentioned, many, many um, uh, Chinese citizens have four to five houses and as, as they have more and more housing, they're being more and more encouraged to take mortgages. So um, when housing became a thing to do, originally there wasn't a lot of mortgages going on. Now uh, Ch many Chinese cities have, are holding large mortgages um, and uh, basically what's going on also is that the land will be opened up uh, for development. It won't get completely sold um, so that, and because the uh, bank and the develop, like is also the government, um, the bank and the government are one and the same, uh, that the government will open up more land for them to develop so that and give them a loan for that land so they can pre buy back their previous loan. Um, so it's kind of a bit of a Ponzi scheme going on um, here because of the relationship. So there's really a mismatch between supply and demand, um, which is creating this kind of uh, economic situation where the government keeps opening up land so developers can, can pay them back uh, with their new loans. Um, and uh, addressing this oversupply issue is something um, that's really looming ahead. And so ultimately what we hope we've done in the cities that we've run this model is create a map that maps out risk in the real estate market um, in China, but also provides a tool for pl local planners to think about ways that they can uh, develop those areas in order to make them thriving communities through the amenities that they can um, get. So one of um, the things I mentioned at the beginning is I'm really interested in bringing data to broader public. So uh, we actually exhibited uh, this work at the Seoul um, uh, Biennial Art and Architecture Biennale that's on exhibit right now. Um, and it allows people to explore um, the amenities um, and uh, uh, our interactive website, uh, but also when we did um, our project, we actually flew drone imagery um, of all of these ghost cities. And so actually what you're seeing here um, is a linking up of that uh, ghost city with um, our interface itself. Um, so I'm gonna move to another project. Um, this project, um, is really about how you can build data sets um, outside of government uh, channels and how those can have an impact on policy. Um, so um, I've done work in Nairobi for some time and um, Nairobi streets look like this. And actually this is um, a condition in many rapidly developing cities. They're expanding. Uh, before the road network um, ex uh, exists to capacity to handle it. Um, and um, I've been working in Nairobi since around 2006, um, 
long time. Um, and I actually made one of the first GIS data sets for Nairobi because I was building a transporma transportation model uh, for the World Bank, uh, which was trying to figure out kind of uh, new traffic patterns um, in Nairobi. So I actually had to build that data set, and this is actually a screenshot from our model that we built at that time. And we created one of the first land use maps for the city, and this is actually looking at in the density in and around Nairobi, and you can see some of the informal settlements. But one of the issues I had when I built my model was I didn't have data on the matatus. These are these small vehicles here that are the main form of public transit in Nairobi. Um, and the 3.5, roughly 3.5 million people depend on these matatus every day um, to get around the city. This is what a matatu is like. show TV show Sense 8 one person there's a, actually a Matatu driver in that sometimes more people have seen it um, but Matatus are you know have a culture behind them people love to they love and hate the Matatu system there's a Jay-Z and Beyonce Matatu the Sense 8 TV show has a Van Damme uh, Matatu, which exists, it is a, a real Matatu line in Nairobi, just in case you were wondering. Um, but I thought, um, you know, how could we create raw data for our model, um, but then create data for everyone? So, you know, if I couldn't find information on uh, where these Matatus were, um, many people in Nairobi probably were not able to get the information um, of how to get, get around. So you might know your route um, and how to get into the city, but you might not know other routes. Um, so I thought, could we leverage the ubiquitous nature of cell phone use in Nairobi, Kenya, to capture data about the informal transit system, which most citizens depend upon, and open that data up for anyone to use and build upon? Um, and so we developed an app with the University of Nairobi that actually collects data on each route. And I should just stop and say that the Matatu system is self-organized. It's a private system, but um, there is a Matatu organization that sets routes and stops. Um, sometimes the enforcement is, uh, let's say, a bit... Um, unsavory, but it works. Um, uh, and uh, because many gangs actually own, uh, well, <laughs> the interesting things is many police officers own Matatu lines and also many gangs own Matatu lines. It's a kind of interesting characteristic. But in any case, we created an app with the University in Nairobi um, that actually tracked where the Matatus went um, and tracked each stop. We did this partnership with the University of Nairobi because we wanted to build the tech technology there so that if we didn't get another grant, that technology and resource would stay in Nairobi itself. And actually, a lot of the students that worked on this project went to their hometowns and did the matatus in there. So there's now an Eldorado data. Um, there's also Mombasa data. Um, and we collected this data in a format called GTFS. Has anybody heard of GTFS? Does anyone? Anyone? We usually have one person. Oh, one! Yay! <laughs> There's usually only one person in the room that knows what GTFS is, but you guys all probably use it on a regular basis. So GTFS is the underlying data structure in Google Maps that allows you to navigate your transit system. So if you ever were somewhere and you wanted to know how to get around 
on the bus and you use the transit option in Google Maps, the back end is GTFS. Why did we create this in this GTFS standard is because there's tons of open source software that uses GTFS as its uh, framework. So data that analyzes accessibility to transit, routing programs, all kinds of access. So if we were to make this data in this open data standard, we knew that we would be able to leverage our data set for further use. What does the data look like? It looks like... Um, uh, uh, GTFS data set streams in, um, it gets a, a unique identifier, um, we get information on the bus, bus uh, stop, it has uh, latitude and longitude information, and then time in which um, the bus is coming. And what you're seeing here is actually, um, it's really actually creating the road data set as, um, as the data comes in itself. Um, and I just want to note here uh, one thing that we did as part of the project for my traffic model was to actually record um, designated stops, stops that were designated by the city, and then um, also um, we created undesignated stops. And you can see these are these blue dots that are like everywhere, which really cause a lot of the traffic congestion flow. Um, one of the reason that the Matatsus use the, there's a lot of reasons they use the undesignated stops, but a lot of the designated stops are, are actually unsafe. They're put, they're basically turnouts that are like right before a circle and so cars are coming in. So there's, but there's also a little bit of opportunists uh, going on. So um, the data was messy and overlapping, and we wanted to try to figure out how we could communicate like the many, many different routes that might exist on one uh, quarter or one roadway. And so we started to pull apart um, the data set um, into um, groups, um, we gave quarters, different colors to try to organize it um, and really tried to um, figure out how we could do the other half of the project was to bring this data to anybody. Um, and um, ultimately, we decided that the best way to look at this information would to be to stylize it um, and to make it in the form of a transit map much like you might see in New York, London, Paris. Um, and then we added only the really important stops, not all of the stops that you saw there. And when people in Nairobi navigate the city, um, they don't use addresses, they use landmarks. So they'll say something like, I'm going to Safaricom. And so those main landmarks were the uh, stops that were used in the map. Ultimately, we developed this map but what I want to note is that we actually developed the map um, in coordination with all of the stakeholders. So this is actually the Matatu Drivers Association. They have their own union helping us edit our map. And one of the things that you see that they're doing is they're actually noticing that there's not a lot of um, Matatus in the northern area of the city and they're thinking about ways to develop routes as they're actually editing our map. And so one of the things I want to highlight about this is that, you know, in Nairobi, the Matatu owners are really the de facto, planner, de facto planners of the city. And by visualizing this data set and showing it to them, we we're creating a tool that they could use to actually help um, enhance the, um, the ridership along the city. Um, when we built the data set, we asked everybody to participate. We asked the government to come. We asked stakeholders, academics, the local tech community, the Matatu drivers. And I would say that they came to meetings, but they were largely disinterested. Um, um, but um, but we, we asked them to do it together, which really helped the project because people trusted the data set. And so actually, the maps uh, went viral, um, we got them in the paper, and they became very iconic 
in Nairobi because many of those different organizations that we invited to the table felt like they co-owned the project with us. And so they were able to help us promote it because they felt like they were part of uh, the work. And so this gets to the point of like, how do we measure success in an open data project? And I think that's when others leverage the data we created to generate their own policy change. It's kind of the idea of like, once it's out of your hand, they do something great with it. Um, so this was really exciting to us when we got invited to this press conference and um, the governor of uh, Nairobi County and uh, the, the mayor um, actually unveiled the uh, digital Matatus map as the official map of the city. Um, they said that it was theirs. I think we were all a little like, oh wait, but we made this. But then we realized this is actually the change that we wanted to see. They felt that they trusted the data enough that they could actually release it as their own. And it really allowed it to get out in the city and get out to much more people than if we were to try to do that ourselves. So it was really um, exciting uh, to have that happen. We held um, a number of hackathons with the tech community. We released the data in the GTFS format. There are now five businesses in Nairobi that use this data set. Um, uh, one of them is the second largest app in Nairobi and it's like a Waze-like app. So what it does is that you can route yourself on a Matatu, but then it, what they do is um, they add information about if there's a crash or a Matatu's been diverted. So it's like kind of a Waze uh, uh, kind of transit alert app. Um, this map, um, I was in a meeting in UN Habitat, and I'm sorry for the quality of this. This is like a picture I was able to take. Um, so they're developing a bus rapid transit system in Nairobi. Does it, do you guys know what bus rapid transit is? <laughs> <laughs> I did notice that there is something going on outside with the uh, bus rapid transit. Uh, <laughs> So you are very familiar with it. Well, they're doing this in Nairobi. Um, and this is, uh, the World Bank is uh, producing the lines. And this is actually the map that the World Bank used. It looks very similar to something that you have seen earlier um, in this presentation. And I think what's important here is that the bank really wanted um, to kind of leverage the positivity around the Matatu map so allow the public to associate the BRT system with the Matatu SAP and kind of leverage that visualization to kind of encourage um, uh, their own change. So it just really talks about the power of visualization um, when, you're look, uh, when you're thinking about um, not just the data set, but also um, how it, it is introduced. Since we've done this project in Nairobi, um, there have projects all over the world, and I actually just came back um, from Egypt where um, Amman uh, used our tool and made a map, uh, uh, Lebanon, or Beirut in Lebanon created a map, and Egypt is just using our tools to create their own map. In, uh, there's also many projects in Latin America, Managua, using our tools to create a map and um, also create a map, but also collect the data in the GTFS format. So um, we're really excited about all these projects that are, are taking the tools that we created in Nairobi um, and really creating their own change. Google itself uh, is using and leveraging this data set. So because we made the data in GTFS format, they uploaded it into Google Maps. And I think what's really significant and important about that is that um, now people in Nairobi actually can create alternative routes. So one of the biggest reasons that there are congestion problems in Nairobi is because every, everybody goes into town and then comes back out. Um, and so there's this kind of massive amounts of uh, vehicles going to town and then coming back out. And if you don't know your route, what a typical person in Nairobi would do is they say, oh, I'm going to go into town, 
I'll ask one of the Matatu drivers in town like where the bus is to catch it to the uh, junction. So here what we're looking at is um, what is the route to Kengenge, flyover to junction, right? And you can see you can go into town and come back out, but actually there's alternative routes. And so one of the things that we hope is that people um, make decisions about how to get around the city and, and that we can create some behavior change that helps reduce uh, the, the traffic and congestion flow. So semi-formal transit provides uh, mobility around the world. Um, and we're actually creating a global network resource center for people to do this work um, um, elsewhere. Um, there's also a project in Accra that's just coming out in Lagos. Um, so I'm going actually to, um, to uh, Paris in two weeks to just uh, try to get those projects started. So I'm super excited that they're catching on. Um, so another project um, that um, is a little bit closer to home, we saw two very far afield, is a project that's called City Digits. And one of the things that I'm really interested in is um, the issue of data literacy. We, uh, increasingly, we're li living in a data-centric society. Um, we're making decisions about uh, urban places based on um, uh, data and so um, I teamed up with the New York City uh, Department of Education uh, to create a, a data literacy program um, that uses data uh, from the environments where youth live in um, and also hopefully teaches them math skills. So we actually for this project picked uh, the lottery as our theme. Um, and this is really because uh, the lottery is everywhere in New York City, it's all around them, and it affects people in different neighborhoods at, at different rates. Um, um, the, the other part of the lottery is that it has an inherent math, mathematics behind it, um, and that math um, can uh, really relate to real world situations that they see on the street and is really a social justice issue for many of them. So we use not just data, but uh, visualizations to teach probability um, of learning, um, to understand the structure of the lottery that actually goes to education resources in New York City. So the lottery, they also learn uh, here probability. Um, and we developed this map, and I'm just gonna pause here. Actually, let's go back. Um, I'm gonna pause here. Um, we uh, developed this interface, if you wanna look at it, it's called citydigits.mit.org. Uh, and what we did is we got the lottery winning sales and wins every, at every bodega across New York City. Um, and so this map, is actually showing um, that the, the uh, green is showing how much people uh, spend and the purple is how much people win. So like just when they're looking at the map, they can see that the odds are usually against them because, and this includes um, scratch off tickets, everything that you can think of. Um, and then we uh, ask the tools, we, we create a number of exercises that the students had to work with using these tools. So um they actually can look at neighborhoods like fort green and bushwick and look at um, how much each neighborhood spends on the lottery um, and then they can see that like when you're looking at bushwick and park slope there's a big difference in the amount of income that's spent and then we had tools that actually visualize the math behind um, these various aggregations um, in order for them to, to learn math skills. But one of the things that I think is really important is bringing qualitative and quantitative data together. So the tool actually allows the students to go out into the field and collect stories uh, from people about whether they think the lottery is good or bad. The tool uploads it directly onto the map and then um, the students actually have uh, the data set to draw from um, and their interviews recorded. I just want to take a minute to note that all the projects in the lab take huge teams to put together. 
Um, and it's, I couldn't do it without my students, but also my collaborators. Um, in this project, uh, we had so many um, uh, 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 teachers that were helping us edit um, um, uh, the, the product and program. And um, if we didn't have that, those uh, people, but I think what I want to stop also and emphasize is that really it takes teams to create impact with data. You need the data scientist, you need the policy expert, you need the designer to visualize it and contextualize it. And teams are a really important way to create a larger impact. So actually, this is um, uh, one of the teams that we were working with in youth in New York City School. And one of the things we found out in the first release of City Digits is that students in New York City actually didn't know how to read maps. And so we had based this tool on the premise that they understood the different geographies. They understood like where Park Slope was versus Bushwick. And actually, the, um, uh, we found that the geographic literacy wasn't that good. So we actually decided to incorporate um, mapping into the next iteration of the tool. So this is, you're seeing a map that's really the size. This is like um, uh, right here like a very large map and um, we asked them to kind of mark themselves on the map and kind of understand the relationship of how they get to school and actually help them use this um, tool in a much different um, way. We did a second iteration of the tools that looked at pawn shops um, and informal banking and we hope to do many more um, of these tools. Um, but again, um, as I said, we were interested in bringing these topics to a uh, larger public. So this was actually, this project was in the Cooper Hewitt uh, Museum last fall as part of a project looked at design, how design can impact communities. And um, there were a number of uh, youth education centers with New York City teachers to help them get it into their classrooms. So we worked with the Bushwick School of Just Social Justice, but now a lot of uh, um, um, teachers throughout the city um, use, the, use this tool. Um, I want to talk about um, a more recent uh, project um, which is just just being released, um, and so we're gonna have a conversation about it. Maybe you guys can help be my team to think about the impact for this project. So, um, in this project, um, uh, I was asked by the Gell Institute uh, to think about how we can measure the social impact of public space, um, and really. Um, Gell believes that you know public space is essential for creating a public realm and creating debate in cities. Um, and our own city of Boston um, has this uh, uh, really problematic urban <laughs> public space um, that's often uh, vacant um, and um, we wanted to see how we could measure spaces like this but also, more importantly, measure interventions in public space. So this is uh, the new mayor of Boston is trying to get really creative um, and uh, bring, bringing tactical urbanism projects to the plaza. Um, and we were trying to kind of measure the impact of these tactical urbanism projects, which there's a lot of deba debate um, in the literature right now about uh, what these projects do, um, they do create a public space, but a lot of people say is it kind of um, not thinking about a permanent public space. So one of the things that Gell's really interested in is how can we create evidence to show that these public spaces are beneficial so we can make them more permanent. So um, if urban designers and planners have worked to answer this question, the character of a good public space um, to increase the pu public realm. And this has been a topic for some time. We know uh, that William White in his study, The Social Life of Small Urban Places, really tried to um, see if he could measure the character of, of public space. He used also digital technology to do that. Um, through cameras um, and um, and created as and I'm sorry for the quality of these images uh, the 
where I try to create data visualizations of um, this work. MIT's own Kevin Lynch um, um, tried to kind of map the character of public space by asking the people who lived there to tell him what was most important and by drawing actually maps of those spaces he hoped to, um, to really understand the importance of the public realm or what was important to the public themselves. Um, and it's little known that he also used digital technology to do that um, through cameras. And then Jan Gale, who was uh, the Gale Institute who's really funding this, is kind of a more contemporary uh, version of this. And really, um, Jan Gale has a practice um, that uh, when people um, hire the Gale practice, they, one of the things that they do is spend a ton of time measuring the public space to create evidence for their design interventions. Um, Young Gale um, has really uh, uh, kind of works with di uh, different visualizations. He looks at like the actually patterns along one street quarter across the day and creates these um, extensive data. And he large, like largely the Gale Institute, when they go to a site, they use these clickers. I actually just came from a Gale conference where I presented uh, our benches, which I'm going to show you. But um, they gave me a clicker in my tote bag, which I thought was hilarious. Um, really analog way of measuring data. And they're really interested in thinking about uh, ways to make this more digital, digital. But these are some of the maps that they actually created for a study they did in Melbourne, which really tells us like detailed information about who, what businesses and so forth are along the street. So there's lots of Lots of uh, literature behind how we measure public space. And so we thought, how can we create a tool that does that um, using sensors um, in, to measure this idea of place making? Um, and we teamed up with Build a Better Block, um, most specifically their project called Wikiblocks, which um, uh, Build a Better Block is a tactical urbanism uh, um, group uh, that helps uh, communities put on uh, pop-up uh, spaces. Um, and a lot of times those pop-up spaces use urban furniture, which you can then send to a CNC router uh, to mill. So you don't actually have to, so they kind of, uh, uh, it's a very cheap way to make uh, these furniture. So we um, created two pieces of furniture one is a bench and one it we call the sandwich board and the bench me measures seating preferences and patterns throughout the day um it's uh we kind of developed it for its ease of fabrication it's highly modulable durability and uh scalability so these were some of the early prototypes of um this bench that we created um but ultimately we um, picked this uh, design, um, which is stackable uh, benches. Um, and the bench um, itself uh, uh, just needs um, one uh, piece of plywood um, and can be sent to a CNC router. And it only needs two, it needs four rods to put together. Um, the sensor itself fits right into the bench and it uh, measures if you're sitting on it, it has uh, information, uh, microphone sensor, um, light sensor, a GPS to see if it moves, um, and um, uh, uh, temperature and humidity also. Um, here's a CNC routing it. This is uh, the students putting the bench together. Um, these are us putting the sensors together, which took forever. Um, this is kind of the uh, skeleton of these before the sensors went out into the field. And then here they are released um, in, on the MIT campus. Um, and then we created um, what we call a sandwich board, which actually measures um, how many people walk through the space. Um, and also um, how people move the benches. Um, and so this is some of the uh, uh, uses of the benches in the space here at MIT. Um, 
one of the most common uses was actually somebody leaning on the back of it, which meant it was hard to tell from our load if they actually were sitting on it. And a lot of people used it as tables. Um, the sensor actually had wood uh, uh, light on the bottom, um, and um, the light told us how many people sat on it in a particular day. And so these are actually uh, the benches uh, lit up um, um, on campus here. Um, and we ultimately, we were able to measure how many pedestrians walked through the space. We were able to uh, measure how much the benches were used throughout the day um, and where they were used. Um, people even moved them to the covering underneath on a rainy day. Um, and we could actually begin to see how people use the public space because we had information about where the benches went um, and how people moved them uh, around the space itself. Um, and we began to create uh, visualizations of how, how people actually use the benches. Um, obviously, uh, well, not obviously, you can see that a lot of them were here around the shade um, of the trees. Um, um, and we uh, just uh, released uh, this version of the benches and Charlotte with um, Build a Better Block. Um, and then uh, here on the Tactical Urbanism Project in um, uh, the uh, Boston <coughs> City Commons just last week. Um, uh, so we hope that this helps city managers understand how things like holidays, weather, and temporary installations impact usage patterns um, and make more efficient monitoring, tracking for public space, and offers a credible and transparent approach to uh, um, uh, putting the data out. This is actually our team. One thing I want to note is that the sandwich board had a GoPro in it, and what we did is actually, it was, we used image recognition software to actually measure how many people were moving through the site and where they were. Um, the image, we didn't want to collect data or make people feel like they were being surveilled, so the way that the, the tool works is it takes the image, and measures where they are in the space, collects that data point, and then deletes the image, and then only sends the data back, so that we're not actually keeping images of people. Um, so it's, pro it's processing uh, people's uh, uh, face or so forth, but then that's deleted instantly, so that we just have the data as the result, instead of having, I like did not want to get into the, um, a situation where um, I felt like people thought that they were being surveilled. I will say that part of the design, we really wanted to expose that we were sensing people and we made them very transparent. So the reason that they have this design, um, you could actually see the sensor box in it collecting data. That actually became a problematic design element because people thought it was a bomb. Because <laughs> if you look at those, if you look at those sensors, they really look like a bomb. So the first kind of time people went up to the benches themselves, they like were very weary. So we actually had to add a sticker onto the bench that says, this is not a bomb. Um, um, but um, I'm just like uh, looking at, at time. And I think that um, uh, maybe I'll stop with this project. Um, uh, but I really encourage you guys to all check out uh, the website. We have a lot of different projects that we're working on in, in the lab. Um, a lot right now um, working with image recognition. Um, uh, this is one project that uses that data set, but we are also doing it um, with um, uh, Twitter and Instagram photos and so forth. Um, and so. Um, if I have time, I could tell you a little bit about more projects, but I'm probably over my time at this at this point. So I will <laughs> answer your question. I could do one more project. No. One more. How are you guys feeling? Let's ask questions, and then maybe if you're curious about the social media, I'll put it on. <laughs> that, that sounds fair. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. Are there any questions for Sarah? Yeah. yeah. Did you show the social media stuff? No. I'm just yeah, yeah, I can, I can. I'm, I'm <laughs> if we have nothing to talk about, that would be a good answer. Yeah. No. I was, I was yeah. wondering, um, 
what, you know, the, to me the goals of the transportation projects were a little more clear than, than this one. I guess I'm curious how you're looking at applying this information to um, how, how it might affect design and, and landscapes and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I think a part of the reason that this is less clear is because it's like much more at the beginning than some of those other projects. And like one of the things I think about is that every project has a multiple multiple lives, right? So um, the Nairobi project, like we built like five different tools before we got the right tool to actually collect the data. So if you saw it at the beginning, I feel like this project, um, you know, the idea is to like, uh, create this sensor to collect data to create evidence for why tactical urbanism projects are effective or not effective. I think that the data is messy that comes from these sensors and what we're working on over the next couple of months is really trying to actually clean it and figure out how to com convey it in a visual way so that it will have an impact um, um, on um, some of the public officials, but um, I just held I, literally yesterday a focus group with um, um, a number of Gale Institute uh, uh, people who do these measurements and like it was interesting because they were like, oh, the data doesn't matter as much as like the calling your congressman. Um, so uh, anyways, that, <laughs> that was interesting, but um, I do think that um, as, as, as we refine both the tool, and we're actually in this stage of trying to figure out what is the right visualization um, to convey. So Jan Gale has created a number of visualizations, which I also am not sure are completely effective. They may be useful in his own practice working with his clients, but maybe not on the scale of the city. So yeah. it's a good comment. I'd be curious to uh, hear your take on the, uh, the state of data literacy in the design and planning professions as well as in, at the education school level. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, um, so uh, I came to MIT five years ago to the planning department and um, was shocked at how uh, there was a limited data literacy among at least our planners. Um, and it's been a real mission of mine to actually like increase um, the technology curriculum at MIT. And I think that, <laughs> sounds crazy, increase the technology curriculum at MIT. Um, but um, yeah, that sounds like a, a, a anyways, um, but I think that has a lot to do with planners. Um, have, there's like a, there was a huge backlash to using data in planning because of the kinds of things that happened in the 50s and 60s, the highways that were developed based on like a kind of logical models. And um, pl but planning education is still kind of exists within that state. And I think over the last five years, I have increased a lot of data literacy. I'm super excited to say that um, I teach one of the classes I teach is an app development class, and like last year, three of my students got startups off the ground and are using big data and other kinds of data sets to do projects. And so, um, I think, um, but I think because of this long period of time where uh, we weren't, where planners were not taught about data, there is in government. Um, Many government officials, I would say, do not have a data literacy, um, and they, they're not sure how to implement or use data. And so I think uh, it's really important for us as academics and planners to bring data literacy to um, uh, the field and the practice, even if you don't use it in your practice, but so that you can interpret results that you see, um, because there's a lot of um, uh, problems with the way people use data. So I think it's really important. One more question? Dylan. Yeah. <laughs> so those benches, um, well, I guess 
Super question. Yeah. Um, so for understanding like the way people interact with them, you use the GoPros, right? To yep. like analyze how they're doing it. But what, how did you position them inside the benches? And specifically, why did you guys choose GoPros instead of like a like a PIR sensor or like other methods of interpreting how people interact through the space? Yeah, we um, let's see, we had the we tried a lot of different sensors. The, so the GoPros were meant to count the site, not necessarily how the benches were um, actually, <laughs> they were meant to actually just count, like when we started it, count how many people came to the site, because that's one of the GAL methods, and how long they, they stay at the site at a given time. Um, we um, use other, we had other sensors as well that we tried that actually the GoPros do the best. Image recommendation, recognition gets you the best data like like I was able to see how long a person was there I was able to measure where they were and then I would say that the benches had GPS sensors in them but the GPS units were really there they kind of can be flaky um, and the, the image recognition software was much better at identifying the benches and then it made me realize why this image recognition is such a powerful tool because it really um, gave me a very precise data set about how long people were there, what they were doing, what they were doing with the benches. If there was a bike riding through, I could tell a bike. Um, if there were groups of people versus one person, all these things. And so ultimately, um, one of the things that we're discussing as part of our team is like, why did we need this sensor box in the bench? itself uh, because the GoPro does such a, a great job. But the idea of the project was to really try to test different forms of sensing and how well, how well they worked. I think ultimately the bench sensor tells you whether people like to sit on it and move it around. And but like we actually got that from the GoPro data. So I think, um, this is also kind of a, a like a debate that we're having. Like, is it is it surveillance to have this? Go like, I think the reason we tried to avoid the GoPro is because it felt very surveillancey, um, and we did it. So that's why we created that method to actually delete the images before they, um, yeah, so that we wouldn't hold them. Right on. Thank you. Yeah. Uh -uh. I was just wondering about the bench project since they were mainly movable. Did any of them wind up going missing? Um, none of them went missing, but it did make me nervous in the middle so of the night. Uh -huh. And actually, they're set up so that you can stack them and lock them into one. Um, so they can be locked together, so they can be stacked on top of each other and then uh, locked with one lock at the, the bottom. Uh, but we didn't lock them, actually. We left them out. But the idea is that they can remain outside. Um, yeah. Anyway, you, you would... I mean, we, we would know because we're surveilling everybody. <laughs> 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 Unfortunately... <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, there's anybody who tried to steal them would be instantly discovered. <laughs> uh, these had, they actually had like basically mini cell phones in them, so the data was going back into our server. So you you could run a like a lost phone app on it, except for it's a bench. <laughs> I lost my bench. Um, yeah. Yes. Any any city planning and national disasters going on that with all this global warming thing uh -huh. or these applications to it? Yeah. Um. Uh, have we done anything like that? Um. Some of my students have actually the. I have a lot of students from Mexico City, and during the earthquake, they just threw up an app. I was like super impressed. They threw up an app that asked people whether they needed help or whether they were offering help and that they made it a map interface and it actually went viral in Mexico City. The, actually, the president tweeted it out. 
um, and it had a map uh, plotted on it. Uh, I, I mean, it had a map interface and a survey tool was really easy to use, which is why um, it became really popular during the earthquake. But um, now my students are dealing with the kind of after effects of some a project like this, like when you engage civics, is that they are now the owners of all of this data about who needs help and who, who can give help, and they become the facilitators of this. So when you create a project, one of the things that's really important to think about is like, who's gonna be in the back end organizing this thing? So these students um, who are students trying to get a degree, um, uh, uh, became an a NGO for a few weeks. They finally have been able to give it to the UN um, who's taking, taking it off their hands so that they can get back into school. But, um, <laughs> but um, a lot of the projects that we've worked in that area have been kind of more response to disasters, but we haven't done any. Uh, I have worked on uh, projects of climate change. Um, I've worked on uh, the Rebuild by Design uh, competition, which was a design uh, competition to look at um, uh, New York City, um, like uh, how to actually create infrastructure for the next hurricane. Um, and actually many of the projects, actually our project, um, in Rebuild by Design, which I did with Alexander de Hoog. Um, we actually won our project. It was uh, um, put on by HUD, and each group that was in the competition, there were um, three groups that actually won. They were meant to actually build their, build their um, site. What's interesting is only one of the competition entries is building their site, that's Scape Landscape Architects. They're building their site off Staten Island. All the other ones, like, got outbid, we got outbid by a RUP. So a RUP is building our project <laughs> instead of us. The interesting politics, which I could get into someday, but so we worked on more kind of the design adaptation. Um, and then I worked on a project re more recently um, for the Regional Planning Association in New York City. Um, they're putting out their master plan um, and we put together um, a, a, a project for uh, buyouts and uh, creating a buyout scenarios, how that happens over time, and which parts of land should be encouraged for buyout programs for people to move uh, to higher ground. So I have done some analysis on that, which I didn't show here, but um, use a lot of data, a lot of data to figure out the buyout programs, where would be good strategies for locations based on like the flooding, economics, um, socio-demographics, um, all kinds of, also insurance, existing insurance. It was all kind of data analytics to put those together. Let's see, uh, is there one more question? Justin? Um, I guess I have a question kind of about, like you touched on it briefly, but in different ways. So the surveillance aspect, moving and transitioning into usable data, huh. and how you essentially go about surveilling a community or a <clears throat> subject group and then transforming that into usable data for that group but at the same time not feel, not making them feel like um, they were you know unjustly watched or yeah I mean like this for this project this is like the project where I feel closest like it makes me feel a little nervous like but and which is why. But we actually had signs all around the project telling people what was happening. And so my thought is that as long as you're telling people that they're being like surveilled, like it's more ethical and responsible, right? Um, and then this other. So I think being transparent is really important. Um, the transparency and just like the Nairobi project, being really transparent about what we were doing uh, was important um, on the matachus themselves. We had every when we did the um, crowdsourcing of the data, we usually had like two people on a bus. One was like talking to the driver and explaining what they were doing um, and just like explaining the project so that they could, could feel comfortable with it. Trust in data is very important, and if people can't trust you or the data set, it's, it doesn't have any value. 
Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you.